see if this thing actually works or not. I think we may be under an ongoing cyber attack right, here right, in real life. So, so it's a pleasure to, to, to talk. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, it speeds the slides up automatically, I appreciate that. So uh, in many ways, this, this session is relevant to everybody because almost all of us live in, in cities. And probably a few of us are maybe hermits in the mountain. So in some sense, whether you are directly involved as a developer, manufacturer, or provider, or whether you're just a victim or an occupier of cities, th this affects all of us. Now, I, I love the, the title of the paper you had, which talked about the year uh, 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 2025. I don't know how many of you remember the 1960s song, in the year 25, 25, if man is still alive. So in many ways, you know, you don't have to necessarily wait to 2025, or even necessarily wait uh, to 2025, if you will. I'm gonna talk about a lot of things that are going on today involving smart cities. Or as I said in my subtitle, sometimes smart cities can be pretty dumb. So in uh, the uh, introduction, uh, for this session, uh, ARC uh, uh, identified about 12 smart city uh, application sectors. It would take me several hours to talk about all of them, but I'll give you a couple examples from a few of them today. And I'm gonna try to end first addressing the issue of smart governance and try to end maybe in a somewhat more optimistic or at least somewhat more action-oriented result. So I won't try to be totally uh, gloom and doom. Let's take the first example here. Uh, of, of smart uh, ap amenities or hospitality industry. There was a headline fairly recently that a massive cyber attack hits 1,200 hospitals in the U.S. Ho, 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 boring, 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 okay. Yet another credit card theft. I mean, th these things don't even make it into most newspapers. You have to subscribe to special services to hear about these things. But how many of you have been into a smart hotel with smart doors that you could unlock with your smartphone, like the New York Hilton, if you will, okay? Some of you have. Well, it turns out a recent issue involved an Austrian hotel that had such a system. Of course, until the ransom demand arrived after all of the guests were locked out of their rooms. So, so in other words, that, that's a case where it's a very nice feature to have, very interesting feature, but of course it introduced a new vulnerability that wasn't there before. And of course, what did the hotel do in response to that? Of course, they're switching back to old-fashioned keys. So I'm not sure if our conclusion is back to the Stone Age, if you will, but this is a serious issue. We have a tension going on that we're moving one step forward, then tripping and going back a step. So this is a phenomenon I think we'll see in many sectors. Another area we've been looking at in our research is, I'm not sure I'm familiar with this term before, but I've learned it as part of this work, mobility as a service. What the diagram on, I guess, your right side shows, is, and this is a projection, of course, is that the sales of autonomous vehicles to individuals kind of flattens out. And what happens, and we're doing work with Singapore in this regard, is kind of a change in the whole notion of how transportation should be done. And basically, you have autonomous vehicles roaming around the cities, Think of it like Uber without Uber drivers in some sense. In the case of Singapore, they predict they can probably reduce the number of actual vehicles by about 60% and improve the overall quality of service as their city is growing. So this is a major area. So the whole idea of this mobility, now of course that involves the issue not only of IT devices, IoT devices and smart devices on board your vehicle, but the ability for the vehicles to interact and coordinate with each other, as well as to orchestrate themselves throughout the entire city. So we're talking about a much more elaborate communication and coordination in order for things like this to happen. Now, of course, much of this is just experimental, and, and in the future, though, uh, many people are very optimistic this will happen, but we've already seen ex limited examples. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with a Jeep Cherokee a cyber attack and so on. So the idea of these vehicles, particularly we're doing research now on our own project, looking at issues of how to disrupt the command and control systems for such vehicles. So the whole idea of this mobility of service is a great opportunity, but has enormous new risk to it that we don't fully yet understand. Now many of you here are from, of course, the industrial control systems and energy industries, and I won't go through the long list of past attacks on issues such as uh, Turkish pipelines or, or uh, German steel mills or, of course, attempted attacks 
on power grids, whether it be ours or Ukraine or elsewhere. I'm going to make something which is probably obvious to many of you, but surprisingly, I find surprising to uh, engineers and professionals in industrial control systems and energy systems, if you will. And that is there are several differences when you start looking at smart devices and the control of them. So first, not only can you do disruptive things, like you mentioned here of elevators stopping between floors or, or lights being turned off, but we've actually done research on what I call physical damage that can take place. Things can explode, break, or even kill people. So that's something you don't normally see in a typical IoT attack stealing credit cards and such. Not only that, when such a things occur, it's not always possible to revert back to manual control. So for example, these autonomous vehicles roaming around the streets of Singapore, I'm not sure they even have a steering, will even have a steering wheel in them in the future. So manual control, whether it be future devices or even many of the devices we have today, are so complex and so automated that there really is no manual override, if you will. What's fascinating, and once again, all I can talk to you is about the examples we have seen. Doesn't mean this applies in every case. But to provide more flexibility to devices, we're finding not only is the controls of devices being automated and instrumented, in fact, the safety mechanisms of those devices are also under software control. So if you think about it, if I can somehow break into the software controlling the device, hmm, I can probably break into the software that controls the safety of that device, and so thereby override it. And we have, actually have an example uh, of that. Now, this is something which I, you know, I'm gonna be, I, I, I promise to make this talk a little bit controversial. So if I don't make you upset by some point by the end, I clearly haven't served my purpose. But most of you, I assume, many of you have had engineering training and it's been deeply intruded in your head, the whole notion of probabilistic failure modes and so on. You know, what, how, many mean, uh, how many, what are the hours between mean time to fail of for this particular motor and so on? And for example, if I have, uh, let's say, eight generators, there's a certain probability any one generator will fail in some period of time. The probability of two of them failing at the same time is not zero, but a lot less, and likewise three or four. But if the failure is not caused due to a mechanical wearing down, but due to a cyber attack, all eight generators could fail at the same time. Now this is kind of obvious to any of you think about it, but it's amazing how many people say, hmm, I hadn't thought of that before, because we're so deeply rooted in our minds, the whole notion of the probabilistic failure of things. And of course, as we've found many times, recovery when there's actual physical damage is not just a matter of sending someone out to reset the relays, which can take time, we have to go locate them and so on, or reloading software, which can be annoying as well. Uh, we've had cases where the recovery has taken weeks, in one case took three months. So a physical damage to industrial control system equipment uh, can be very time consuming to deal with. Now, by, just by coincidence, I came across a headline, I think it was either yesterday or the day before, it read something like this. North Korea, by the way, this is before the Olympics started, so everybody was in a kind of bad mood then, now they're in a better mood now maybe. But North Korea attack could shut down the US power grid and kill 90% of Americans. Now I didn't actually read the detailed report that goes behind it. This was done from a congressional investigation. Now it turns out they were looking at the possible impact of an EMP, possibly caused by a ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead on it and so on. Uh, that could shut down the power grid, and it says here if millions could die from starvation, disease, societal collapse. Uh, once again, I'm not saying that report has any validity or not. I have not read it. I'm just giving you an example of the things that people talk about. But what I thought was interesting that they didn't think about is they were focused on an EMP attack, which clearly has a lot of impacts to it. But my view is a cyber attack makes so much more sense for two reasons. For the first reason, if you think about it, a, cyber, a, a, a EMP attack from some place like North Korea would be easy to identify, easy to determine the location, and most likely would have fairly immediate and, as they say, overwhelming response. A cyber attack, particularly if they intersperse Arabic code here and there in the email, in the documents and so on, could easily be murky as to who actually did it. Was it a unit of ISIS? Was it the Syrian Electronic Army? Was it North Korea? Who are you going to send missiles at? So if I was going to do something like that, 
I might try to do it as a cyber attack instead. In any case, so it's just an example of the kinds of things that people are at least beginning to start to worry about. And of course, it's not just this congressional group. Uh, Ted Koppel came up with an interesting book uh, with a fascinating phrase in it. It says, a devastating cyber attack on America's power grid is not only possible, but likely in the United States is shockingly unprepared. I'm looking forward to my other panelists telling me how far off base we are in these concerns, if you will. As I mentioned before, in our own research, we've been trying to understand this notion of a cyber attack that not only shuts things down for an hour, two hours, three hours, a day or two, but one that could actually destroy equipment. And we have a paper describing how a cyber attack on things like uh, variable frequency drives, VFDs, uh, could not only st stop them from working, but actually cause them to explode and possibly damage uh, nearby equipment. And of course, this was done to some extent in the Suxnet attack and as I mentioned before, uh, in many of the cases, these ones we've looked at, not only are they attackable, but in fact the control mechanisms, safety mechanisms, are also controlled by software. Uh, this is, for those who are interested, a video of it watching it blow up and so on. This was a very small one. Someone gave us a much bigger one. We're just trying to find someone willing to go and make it blow up and, and, and we haven't figured out what the liability license are involved in that one, in any case. Uh, for those who are interested, we do have a, a, a fairly uh, extensive uh, research program at MIT. This is a small pitch about it, but I'm going to focus in on just one piece, which is almost hard to read here, that we call cyber safety. So cyber safety, and I think several of the other speakers at earlier sessions talked about this. In many ways, you can think of accident prevention as being maybe 100 years of maturity developing, whereas cyber protection, if you will, is basically in the infancy. But our belief is there's a lot that can be learned by understanding how we can reduce or prevent accidents. Uh, we've been working with a number of our colleagues at MIT. I don't know how many people are familiar with Nancy Levson in MIT's aeronautics department. Uh, she, among other things, was part of the commission that was put together to look at the challenge of space shuttle. I'm going to give you just a 30 seconds about it. For those who may remember, uh, the Challenger Space Shuttle uh, took off on a particular chilly uh, Florida day. As it turns out, I'm not an aerospace person, but there are these things called O-rings, which I guess are kind of a rubbery-like material that if it gets too cold, become kind of brittle. They fractured, uh, cracks occurred, a gas leaked out, ignited, and exploded. And of course, her study committed, committee, of course, confirmed pretty much all of that. That's what you most likely read about in the newspapers. But what's interesting about her committee was they determined that an accident, not necessarily this particular accident, but an accident of this kind was likely to occur due to organizational changes that had taken place to NASA over the previous three years. The particular case they cited was a transfer of control of the safety division to be under the operations division the operations division had contractual obligations for a certain number of shuttle launches within a certain time window. And although nothing was planned over those three years, the practices, procedures, and risk tolerance of the organization slowly had changed to the point that this commission concluded that they were operating in a very risk-prone manner that would make some kind of accident likely. Now, the reason I'm saying that there's a tendency for us to focus on the last step, whether it be the PLC that malfunctioned or the O-ring that cracked, and not look at the total system that's involved. So we, there's a methodology that uh, Nancy Levson developed called STAMP. I can never remember what it stands for. We've adapted it and gave it something a bit more catchy. We call it cyber safety. So it's based upon the same idea she has. And there are three key parts to it. The first part is you start top down by understanding what it is you're trying to prevent. Now, there's going to be a session, I forgot, I think it's on Wednesday, where they talk about four questions. And one of the questions was, what can go wrong? Which is a variation on the notion, what are you trying to prevent? So it's not exactly the same four questions in this methodology. So it starts with, what is, the, what is your goal? But then it also has a process model. It says everything that goes on in your operation whether it be mechanical or electronic or human process, exists. There are all kinds of processes. But then there are control mechanisms for these processes. The control mechanism may be mechanical, it may be electronic, it may be human. 
And of course, that control process itself is a process, which once again can be controlled by something mechanical, electronic, or human. So there is a hierarchical structure. And it's somewhat related to the issue here uh, of, of the four questions they're gonna talk about on Wednesday, that is, you know, what is it you're trying to, to uh, what could go wrong? What are you trying to prevent? What do we, what do we know that is work, that we're supposed to work to prevent that? And what do you have to do? So it, it's not the same four questions, but this is a methodology that in many ways has a lot of overlap with this. So it's a methodology. I, I won't go more about it, but we do have several papers about it. And it really broadens your horizon. I'll give you a, one or two short examples that illustrates it. So let's talk a little bit about smart governance. Uh, I, I made a quote once, and I got a lot of backfire on it, so I went to a colleague of mine and felt, well, if they don't like me quoting it, I'll have someone else make their own quote. And this is a Larry Susskind, a professor at MIT's Urban System Department. Sounds like he should know maybe a bit about smart cities. And this is only an excerpt from his quote. Millions could be left with no electricity, no water, no public transportation, no waste disposal for weeks, even months. No one could protect critical urban infrastructure on their own. That's kind of not too surprising for what we heard. But then he ended that sentence with, nobody though is showing any leadership. And this is where I want to talk about the issue of smart governance, or maybe I should say smart leadership, if you will. Uh, let me take an example. I'm gonna, this is one I got in trouble with in the past. Let me see how much trouble I get with it today. How many of you are you familiar with the Marushi Shire sewerage spill in 2000 in Australia? How many people are familiar with it? Maybe a oh, handful of you. For those of you who maybe remember, what, what lesson did you learn from it? You, 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 sir, do you remember anything? It's completely fermentable. What, what actually happened? You remember what happened? Well, what happened is it turns out they basically let go or fired a consultant. It's a long story here. And they left him with both access to the control controllers, if you will, and access to the system. Okay? And most people say, okay, that's about, well, that's perfectly controllable, preventable. Uh, it, you're wasting your time even looking at it. So we decided to do much like saying, oh, the O-rings cracked. And all you got to do is have better O-rings next time. You know, they missed the whole point if you take that of you. So here's some things we learned about it. First thing we talked about is, I'm going to do another survey here. This is called real-time data gathering. Two questions I'm going to ask. How many of you feel that if your facility is air-gapped, you're now cyber safe? I see one hand. How many of you feel your organization currently is air-gapped? Only one. Interesting, if you about it. So it turns out here, for example, in many ways, their view was kind of like that, is they kind of viewed themselves as being air-gapped. They weren't really thinking about cybersecurity back in 2000, but there is this natural notion that we're air-gapped. As one, one of my students, the best example he gave me, was a virus made it to the space station. Talk about an air-gap. So, you know, you know <laughs> but let's go further into it. What's fascinating was, in this particular case, for two months, they kept having failures. In fact, at one time, Fortunately, we're not there, but I hear this rumor moving to Hyatt. The Hyatt Regency in that Australia had 50,000 gallons of raw sewage pumping onto their lawns, if you will, at one time. And, but for, for two months, the engineers said, oh, gee whiz, just another mechanical failure. I guess we had a bad month, just a lot of mechanical failures. They were totally unaware that they were under a cyber attack. Now, of course, sometimes the, the people will make a big publicity and say, oh, look, we did, we did it to you. In this case, that didn't happen. And so often it's only if the attacker tells you you're being attacked do you know about it. The other thing about it, and this is the key one, the Nushi Shire City Council lacked any emergency contingency response for anything such as this ever occurring before. So the thought exercise, and I understand there may be some people, I'm not sure if they're here today or not, from the Orlando City. I'd be interested to have them speak up during the Q&A. You know, what plans and facilities has your city developed for dealing with any of the issues I'm talking about or the ones that Andy talked about. Uh, in our investigation, we find it hard to find cities that really have thought this through. I'll give you some reasons why in a minute. I'm almost done. This is a good example of what I mean by second order effects, or you call them domino. This is a very simple one, by the way. Obviously, Andy's 2025 ones are much, much more complicated. This is a true story. One of my uh, students uh, li lives in, or has worked, lived in uh, Wyoming. And those who may be from that part of the world may have remembered back in February last year, around this time, there was a big windstorm and it knocked down several of the power line towers around this town. And because of the uh, ice conditions and all, all kinds of complications, it took them uh, quite a while to fix it. The good news though, 
The town had backup power for the water main pumps, so you still had water on your faucet. You still could turn them on. And the water treatment plant had backup, so it still could process the wastage. But it turns out this was a very hilly area with ups and downs. So what they did is, is they would place uh, holding tanks at the lower areas, so using gravity. Gravity, by the way, does not need electricity, at least not too often. So the, all the waste from homes would go into these holding tanks at the lower levels around this town. And then there were pumps that would pump it from these holding tanks to the water treatment plant, which wasn't always located at the lowest levels, to be treated. And of course, these holding tanks were big enough they could hold three days of wastage. And so, in fact, there was never any need to provide pumps, uh, backup power for them. Unfortunately, to restore power to the city took two weeks. After three days, the wastewater pumps filled up and started backing up into the houses. And since you couldn't tell people, be very careful how you use your water, the only way to be safe to avoid getting wastage and, and all kinds of bad medical conditions was just to shut down. So they had power to drive the main water plants, but they shut them off because that's the only way to safeguard the house of the possible having wastewater overflowing it uh, into the house and so on. So, and of course then pe people were told to, uh, suggested to evacuate this, the town because they had no water and no waste and I got no control anymore. That means I'm really running out of time? Could you just advance it a little bit? I don't know why it's all of a sudden stopped working. I'm almost done. Okay, as I said before, this was quoted in the local newspaper. The area had never lost power for so long, so no one had anticipated such a scenario. This is going to be, you save this quote, you will need to reuse it many times before, over and over, because cyber events are always, the, the, one of the more amusing ones I just read, this was a nuclear plant, I guess. The cyber attack wasn't ransomware, wasn't shut it down, was to generate bitcoins. So it wasn't, really, it wasn't really shutting the plant down. It just was consuming 30% of all the CPU power off to the side. You know, I don't know if that was an issue last year. So there's always going to be, oh, we hadn't had that happen before. And you know, it may not be every week or every day, but every three or four months, it'll be something. We have never seen this before. Okay. So here's the question. What is the backup plan for the backup plan? Now, uh, as you may know, for those of you now in Florida, we do have this thing called hurricanes. And very good that civil authorities have thought about the idea of posting evacuation routes for hurricanes. But then what if the gas stations you need to fill your car to evacuate don't have electricity? Well, it turns out, I'm not sure, it was maybe a year or two years ago, uh, Florida passed regulations requiring there be electricity backup for gas stations, dot, 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 but only needs to be done for 72 hours. So maybe that'll be good enough. So I'm almost, okay, so my final point is you need to have a systems perspective and leadership. Uh, one of the things that we're developing as part of our agenda at MIT is a new project we call Leadership in a Cyber Crisis. You know, uh, we've had examples, people mentioned the issue of, uh, of uh, a specter and meltdown and so on. You know, when that all of a sudden occurs, you know, what action does the CEO say you should take? Is it this decision left? to the junior assistant programmer trainee? Or where does, it, where does the organization deal with something that has systemic impact across, whether it be your company or across your city? So this is the, the typical disclaimer. Okay, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you more. I'll be glad to talk, hear you afterwards. <laughs>